So, um, as I said, my name's Kevin Salvage. I'm the European Regional Development Manager for LEADER, based in London in the UK. So, for those of you who don't know me, um, hello. And on the screen currently are my contact details. So, should you have any questions either during this or afterwards, please don't hesitate to contact me. So, as we've been discussing, you know, our industry when it moves from one technology to another, typically starts off by replicating what it did before. And that's what we saw probably with the first of the um, IP OB trucks, um, studio facilities that they simply replicated an SDI workflow. Everything was together. But when now starting to see that there's advantages to breaking those apart and here we can see now in this particular example, the acquisition on the left-hand side has now been connected over a wide area network to a production center where lots of the tools and that that you're familiar with within an OB truck are actually now centrally located. Still, we have the connection to the traditional contribution and distribution circuits. At LEADER, we've been looking at this and monitoring this for a while, and this has resulted in us launching the LVB 440 IP analyzer. And because probably most of us are engineers, that's what the back of it looks like. So as you can see, it is a 1RU COTS based server with two network ports, 200 gig ports and dual power supply connections. And those network connections support up to 100 gig. And it's an optimized CentOS Linux 7 core. So it is a true COTS server. And what at leader we've added onto that is the monitoring and alarm systems for all of the SMPTE 2110-20, 21, 30, 31, and 40 profiles, along with 2022-6. Because um, as we said, we've seen numerous customers who actually have both in their operations, especially those working over a wide area network. Also support for 2022-7, so redundant streams, and PTP version 2, so SMPTE 2059. And obviously most, one of the most critical now is the control and registration using the NMOS protocols that are now rapidly establishing themselves. And the great thing that the LVB 440 provides is eight concurrent analysis engines, and these are completely independent. So it means eight users can have a completely independent view, depending on their operational or production requirements, and they can analyze the network, there's low latency content analysis, and monitoring of the ancillary data. So the primary tool that people use now to monitor the networks using the LVB 440 is going to be the instrument view. And this gives us, to start with, a view of the streams. So we can see here that we have video, audio and ancillary components. We can then make a more detailed analysis of the flows of one of those streams. And then we can look in detail at the timing and everything associated with SMPTE 20, 2110 21. We can also look at packet flows. So, here we have what's known as like a waterfall display where we can see the spread of the inter packet arrival time against time. And you've got your primary and secondary streams as it's a dash seven operation. And we have indication here in this case, that actually 100% of the packets are arriving on the secondary. So although the service is working, this is something that an engineer would probably be keen to correct because if something does happen to the secondary, although it's protected and operating, we could be in for potential issues further down the line. Obviously, we're still moving pictures around. So we need the traditional tools that we use to analyze the color and the picture image like the waveform display and the vector scope display as well 
for colour and saturation of the image. And for those used to the extended gamut displays, like the diamond pattern, those two are also available looking at the Dash 20 stream. Audio hasn't been forgotten and features on the 440 include the ability to down mix into a stereo pair, either 7.1 or 5.1 surround audio. And this can be seen here. We can also show the phase of those audio channels and loudness monitoring over a 15 second, 30 second or three minute period. And finally, there's ancillary data, which obviously now is part of the Dash 40 stream. And we can analyze and make sure that's present and correct within the service. So as I mentioned, we have a traditional kind of workflow from acquisition to production to distribution. And what we've seen over the last two years is a move to kind of a remote IP production center where services and operations have been removed from the OB truck and they've been placed into the remote IP production center. And now we're starting to see some of those services from the broadcast center also migrate into the remote production center. So with the LVB 440, the engineer in charge has the ability to monitor everything that's going on with inside the truck, with inside the production center, and within the broadcast center. But because they're connected over a wide area network, there's nothing to stop now. The engineer in the remote production center viewing what's going on in the broadcast center and the truck. So now he can start to analyze, is the issue within my facility? Is it within one of the other facilities or is it actually part of the network connectivity that's causing me the issue? So if the engineer in the remote production center can do this, there's nothing to stop the engineer in the OB truck looking in or the engineer in the broadcast center viewing the other way. And the 440, also allows remote connection via a web browser from a mobile device. So this means now we don't actually have to have an engineer in any of these production centers and facilities. He can monitor the 440 in the truck, in the broadcast center, and the IP production center. Maybe he's even doing it from the comfort of his own sofa sitting at home. He's had a call, there's an issue, he dials in and starts monitoring there. And the tools that you saw from the instrument view connecting directly to the LVB 440 are also available on a mobile device. So whether that's a tablet or a mobile phone. Here, we're monitoring the status. Now we're looking at the network and the flows. Here, we can see the 2022-7 streams exactly as we saw before. The secondary is 100% of the data flows at the moment. The waveform monitor for the video picture, the audio, and this is where the down mix of the 7.1 and 5.1 to a stereo pair can be invaluable for checking and listening to the audio on a particular service. Again, audio loudness is capable remotely and the monitoring of the ancillary data. So this changes the way we can look at monitoring and analyzing IP networks and production facilities. And with the 440, we've also added another tool called the widgets. And these are a low bit rate, low latency, HTML5 web browser based tool, which means that you can monitor the video streams remotely. And by low latency, I mean two frames of video, which is now comparable to SDI video. And this is making them ideal for remote production operations. And the low bit rate gigabit network interface means multi-viewer displays can be deployed on any network device with a web browser inside or outside of a facility. So if we take a look here, back at our OB truck, 
with its remote IP production center. And this allows us to move the camera shaders out of the truck. And this is actually being done. Here we have an image where the camera shader is monitoring four camera channels and he's viewing them using the widget displays where he's got a picture and waveform. He still has his reference monitor for viewing, but you can see the space that has now saved. There's no waveform monitor display. There's no multi-viewer display. And as I mentioned, the HTML5 browsers can then very simply be configured into a multi-viewer display. And here we have an example where it's purely an IP address that we've, con we've connected to. And this is very simple and easy to configure. And for those who want them in a rack mounted scenario, we have a rack mount solution. And this is with our partner Densitron. And this is a configurable display. So here we have a single image looking at camera five. But if we needed to change that maybe to look at four waveforms and four camera images, it's very simple and easy to pull up one of the pre-configured configurations. And you're looking at the dash 20 streams directly. There is no conversion to SDI. You are now in a true IP world. Again, this may be a configuration of two larger displays that better suit your requirements. And this can also work in a master control environment where you have the traditional instrument views for monitoring and analytics of the IP network and multi-viewer displays like you would do in an SDI world. And with the 440's NMOS integration, you can use NMOS router controllers to switch sources like you, you know, you'd expect to do in an SDI world. And probably the ultimate combination is to put all of these together into a studio production environment where you have both the camera racking, widget views, and the multi-viewer. So you've got your program preview output and you're able to output a studio production. So if we put all this together, and we look at the network connectivity, which now does exist across Europe, there's nothing to stop us doing the following. Let's, let's take a sports production in Lisbon. Let's put the camera shaders in Barcelona and have them racking the cameras remotely on the other side of the, the Iberian Peninsula. Obviously the video replay can be connected via the network. Audio production can be connected via the network. Graphics can be connected. And production staff now can work remotely and with the multi-viewer display, view the sources that are relevant to their particular production requirements. You can have the studio, say it's in Paris. And now we're using a 440 with the widgets to rack those cameras and monitor the program and preview output in that studio. Obviously on the network, we've now got the ability to add home-based content. So celebrities, commentators and that don't need to travel. They can be locally based to comment on the sporting event or the light entertainment program. And then finally, you have your centralized distribution. And again, in the control room for that, you could well have rack mounted displays looking directly at the dash 20 sources that you need to monitor prior to transmission. And then finally, you have your MCR operation, which is looking at all of the dash 20, dash 30 and dash 40 ancillary data. And on top of all of this, again, you can have your various execs monitoring the multi-viewer display and okay. remotely, You've got an engineer who can be monitoring all of the LBV440s across the whole installation and tracking and making sure that everything works. So hopefully you can see that 
the migration to 2110 is going to be a huge enabler for all kinds of live production and the technology now exists so that we can deploy these units remotely, monitor them remotely and provide the quality of service that our customers expect and have come used to from an SDI production with a multi-million dollar OB truck sitting at the venue. Are there any questions? Hey, Kevin. Um, I don't see any in the, uh, the chat log. So um, if anybody has anything, please uh, go ahead and enter that in. Um, or you can simply uh, unmute yourself. Uh, we don't, we don't uh, keep everybody in the dark here necessarily. No. <laughs> um, so what, what kind of, um, what kind of bandwidth do people really need to uh, be able to look at one of these uh, things from their, from their home environment and, and, and how essential is it that that is uh, um, a reliable link? Um, obviously it's nice. I reliable. I mean, we've, we've run this over facilities over kind of the gigabit ethernet network. So this is, this is not the 2110 network. This is right. Kind of the management control layer. Um, probably most people have kind of that have been involved in this have got sort of a, quite a, a guaranteed kind of dedicated network connection if they're going into their home obviously between facilities it's not an issue because that's All right. pretty much what people have you know paid for as their standard connectivity um, okay it's you know it's it's showing that it can be done you know I mean I could fire up my mobile phone now with a 5G connection and I can connect to a device that's in Oslo and I can start looking through it. Uh -huh. I, you know, I can even do a PCAP on a device and send it to somebody. And that's from sitting here in London on a mobile phone. So, you know, I, I could be on a train traveling between venues and somebody says, we've done a rig, you know, we've got an issue with, with cameras in Madrid. What's going on? And, right. you know, this is, you know, the traditional SDI way of test and measurement was that you had to physically connect to a BNC connector. Right. You know, and you saw it was it was a very personal one to one relationship. Uh -huh. But now, you know, th there's nothing to stop you having four or five engineers, you know, monitoring individual bits and pieces and then having a chief engineer that you could escalate it to if you can't resolve the issue. Gotcha. Um, and it's, you know, the first time I saw it running, um, <laughs> we were actually, we were actually, it was, it was part of the um, AIMS kind of um, pre IBC testing. And I remember two guys kind of came out scratching their heads saying, Oh, something's wrong. We can't see this stream. And one of the engineers just said, Oh, wh what's the, uh, what's the multicast address? They said, Oh, it's two, three, nine, dot, dot, dot. And he just picked up his phone and said, what's your email address? And they said, and then one of them went, Bing, you just sent me a PCAP. He said, yeah. He goes, was that what I was doing on the network? Yeah. So cool. um, All right. that's what they were up to. So um, Very good, very know, good. It's, it's just completely changing the way this can be done. Excellent, excellent. So. All right. Well, thanks a lot. Um, I don't see any any other questions rolling in. So uh, why don't we um, why don't we all take a, a ten minute break here, and we will uh, pick up again with. Um, There's other questions. Oh, I, I'm not seeing them. Uh, were you sending them directly to Kevin? Oh, here we go. I'm sorry. Oh, uh, here we go. How does the connection to mobile devices work Wi-Fi? Okay, so I think you covered that. Or do you want to talk about that anymore? Yeah, I mean, I've I've got it set up here. I mean, obviously the Wi-Fi connection is really good because you know um, got a dedicated network. Um, but certainly now with the advent of five G services, you know, it's it's working on five G services, and it's it's like being connected to the device on a hard connection. 
it's very reactive the picture refresh well you think you're connected uh -huh. and you can see all the data flows updating you know instantaneously all right um another question have you found any problems with transmitting ptp over telco infrastructure wan so uh, ptp aware switchers switches um well obviously with as a test and measurement manufacturer we're sort of the referee of this that we we tell it <laughs> as it is um right. so it's probably a bit unfair to kind of disclose any but Obviously, we know wide area and PTP, you know, can be a bit of a challenge if you're you're not aware of what you're doing. And again, you know, having this capability of a device at either end that you can look at and you can say, well, it's good inside facility A, it's good inside facility B. But the signal between you've then got to start looking in between. You know, it's a good old fashioned you know, knife and forking test and measurement, you know, you, you, you <laughs> step your way through the problem till either the problem goes away or the problem appears again. So, so, so what, what I'm hearing you say is that um, diagnose, I mean, being able to recognize if there's a problem is certainly within the realm of the technology, but you don't have any specific examples of it working or not working. Is that what I'm hearing you say? Yeah, you, you, the, the, the PTP piece is the interesting, and that's obviously there's a lot of work going into that over a wide area network. We, we've got a lot of the timing tools on on the device part uh -huh. of the Dash 21, and some of the other bits already are in there so that you can look and um, analyze. I mean, lots of things, probably the big difference we found with IP networks is that as engineers, you become to, you, you come to understand them there's a term you see like a network signature, how it's behaving. Right. You get to understand that certain ports have like a certain bandwidth of interpacket arrival, whereas on other switches, it will be different. And it's like, you know, one's not white, one's not wrong. It's just the signature of the switch. Mm -hmm. And the great thing with the 440 is that you can set up alarms and warnings. So you start to get messages before they become critical so that you can right. address them. Um, like you saw there with the, the Dash 7. It's working, it's protected, but I had everything coming in on the secondary string. Right. Which, just my personal thing, I'd be a little bit nervous about that because if something <laughs> did happen to the secondary, you know, there's a reason why they're all going to the secondary and it's not an even split. I'd like, in an ideal world, I'd like to see it nicely balanced 50-50. Mm -hmm. But we know it's going to swing 20, 80, 70, 30, 60, 40, because that's the way these networks behave. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I understand. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess with 2022-7, if both streams are up and running perfectly, um, you could be bringing all your packets from one stream, even though the other one is, is up and running, I guess. But um, Yeah, I mean, just on that screen, you saw that it actually said it's protected, so it's good. You know, the, the second the the backup service is there right but it's just at the moment if, if you were to you analyze all of the packets and they're all coming from the secondary that's what's making up what you're seeing right, right. so it's it's giving you that indication you know like, mm, why is that i thought we'd load balance this network you know i thought we you know yeah we've done a good job why is it leaning to one one leg not the other right 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 yeah load balancing okay um, that's, that's what these tools do. They give you, they give you that visibility before problems happen. Mm -hmm. And um, it's a case of you understanding and looking at it and saying, that doesn't look right, but it's not taking me off air yet, or it's not affecting the quality of my service. But there's, I'm, I'm, I'm heading off somewhere I might not want to go. Mm -hmm. If uh, this is Steve, Kevin. Hello, Steve. If I, if I could add just one note, just to make sure everybody's clear, the uh, LVB 440 lives on the actual 2110 network, and you're remoting all of the visuals of the measurements. So we don't have to remote the 2110. We don't have to remote the PTP. We're just going to remote the measurements of those devices. So that's the beautiful thing about it is the LVB 440 sits on the 2110 network and 
all we're going to do is remote the data from that. So uh, the network's not near as critical of your connection right. as the 2110 network itself is. So we aren't trying to take PTP across a, a WAN in this case. That's kind of like one of the, watching a multi viewer at home over a uh, HLS connection when the uh, the real multi viewer is uh, 200 miles away in your production facility. You can see what's going on, but you're not you're not trying to get every bit of every uh, image back to your home. Yeah, that makes sense. So so one 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 last question here, I guess. Um, what's the uh, maximum bandwidth um, stream that you can do 100% PCAP with? Whoa. That's a good question. I think I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to take the fifth on that one and come back to you. <laughs> Steve, have you tried it? I. If, no, I have not. Uh, yeah, I would have to go back. Yeah, I mean, I, obviously, you're bringing in multiple streams. Yeah. Um, you know, on, on the on the high speed optics, but the, the question was, you know, how many. You know, can you can you handle a, you I know, a, a 4K, you know, HDR stream? 80 gig that we could actually take a PCAP because that's the uh, throughput. Yeah, I'd be surprised if you can get yeah. that much into memory, but yeah, uh, don't know though. We've we've just added a new feature which is a, called a rolling PCAP. So it's basically doing that, and then at the point you want to stop depending because yeah. you can specify the buffer size how much you want to capture right 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 um yeah, yeah so i think, I think what we can do is we can provide some more buy. details on this it's uh it's okay well darn i don't i usually don't get to stump the experts that's <laughs> hey. that wasn't my question we have to give uh uh props to uh, joe tozer for asking that question